Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we are going to be talking about the narcissist living inside of your head. I'm asked this question quite frequently at the moment. First of all, let me say thank you to everybody who joined me at the London seminar, uh, just gone on Sunday. Really nice group, really, really good day. And um, I enjoyed it, I enjoyed it a lot. We had some good back and forth, some good discussions. I learned a lot by doing it, which is always a useful experience. But there is um, a recurrent theme that I'm hearing a lot from people, which is points to the essence probably of why narcissistic abuse is so painful and so difficult to recover from. And it's to do with this issue of the colonization of the mind. The sad fact of the matter is, is that the narcissist will continue to live inside of your head even if they die, even if um, you split up with them and you get with somebody else, unless you take steps to stop that from happening. And these steps need to be quite specific. They have to address the core structure of the narcissistic relationship and they have to permit you to deconstruct that core structure so that you can get on with the rest of your life. It's hard to describe this without using psychoanalytic language and psychoanalytic theory, but I'm going to try. It's not enough for me to say to you that the narcissist's voice will continue to speak inside of your head. Um, it's worse. Than, <laughs> it's worse than that. It's actually that the narcissist's intentions for you will continue to play out even after the relationship has ended, which is why there's a pattern in some people's lives, it's certainly true in mine, where you can rebound from one narcissistic relationship to the next one, because this impulse, this voice that is more than a voice, it's sort of an intention, continues in you unless you remove it. I'm not, I'm not going to use the psychoanalytic language. I'll say it's something like this. There are parts of our minds that are designed to um, internalize people and to run a simulation of, of people talking to us and even their intentions for us. And that makes sense. That's, that's good. That seems to me to be a positive and intelligent evolutionary adaptation because when I'm born into the world, when you're born into the world and you really don't know anything, um, you need instruction. You need instruction on how to live your life. And so there's a part of your mind that we could say that takes instruction from others and then repeats those instructions. But in order to do that, it internalizes that person. So if you have a person in your life, um, say when you're a child, and they are a good guide for how to live your life, and this person is called Friedrich, not after anybody for no reason he's just randomly called friedrich and he has a big droopy walrus mustache <laughs> you wouldn't want that as an internalized interject um and he gives you good advice and largely speaking you accept him as a powerful and authoritative figure in your life and you internalize friedrich you internalize his voice, his messaging to you. And you also, and this is the, the bit that's kind of a little bit hard to explain to people, you, you internalize his intentions for you. So if Friedrich's intentions for you are that you grow up to be a healthy, happy uh, boy, healthy, happy girl, you're gonna grow up into a healthy, happy man, a healthy, happy woman, and to the best of his ability, with all due sincerity, without perfection, Friedrich does all he can to instruct you in a way instruct you in a way that is genuinely helpful to move you towards good, to move you away from bad, to encourage you to think for yourself, to be resilient, uh, to know when it's time to be cynical and, and realistic and to know when it's time to be a little bit more utopian and idealistic and to apply these polarities with wisdom. And you internalize that you would have a good in a voice with a good internalized intention for you. When you have an abusive parent or a negligent parent or a negligent authority figure in your life, 
um, you internalize a simulation of them in their voice, what they say to you, what they tell you is true about you and what they tell you is true about your life continues to resonate inside of you. Their instructions continue for you, but so do their intentions. When you are in a relationship with a narcissist for a prolonged period of time and you, you, you grow very close to them, you blend with them, you build rapport with them, your boundaries soften towards them. Perhaps you even love them, perhaps you even love them romantically, uh, sexually. I, I think this is one of the, the, the most dangerous and most difficult situations to be in as an adult. Um, the worst situation, obviously, as a child is for one of your parents to be highly narcissistic and psychopathic and to not have good intentions for you. But when you do that, you internalize them as an authority figure. You internalize their voice and you internalize their intentions for you. So if their intentions for you are not good, that voice remains there in that colonized part of your brain and continues on and on and on. And there's no reason to think that it will simply just stop of its own accord unless you do the work. So frequently you'll find yourself and you'll get frustrated and angry with yourself. You'll be saying, um, why am I still thinking about him? Why am I still thinking about her? Um, you know, I haven't seen my mother in 15 years and yet there she is, she's still, I can still hear her as she's still criticizing me in my mind and that's awful. But you can detect that, you can become consciously aware of that, You, especially if you go to therapy and you work with a therapist and, excuse me, my back hurts a little bit, you work with a therapist and um, you can reflect back to them and they'll be like, oh, where's that message come from? And you'll be like, oh God, that's my mom, that's my dad, that's the, I don't know, the pastor who was abusive to me when I was a child. You're consciously aware of that, but what is sneakier, more insidious and therefore more dangerous is when you don't detect a voice, there's just an intention. So to, to make this a little bit more relatable and so I don't drift off into like the, the psychoanalytic jargon, if you've been in a narcissistically abusive relationship and then come out of it, did you notice that the decisions you made immediately after the, the end of the narcissistic relationship were sometimes a little bit wild? And sometimes even a little bit destructive decisions that had maybe nothing to do with the relationship, financial decisions, career decisions, uh, health decisions, uh, lifestyle decisions, and suddenly you're you're behaving in a strange and self-destructive way. That is a manifestation of the part of you that's been colonized by the narcissist's voice, the narcissistic personality, and I claim this is my claim. This is not mainstream orthodox psychoanalytic theory i don't think at least i haven't come across it if someone wants to correct me in the comments please feel free to you're manifesting their intentions as well so let's say you had an ultra psychopathic father who really was found the idea of you uh, growing from a small child into a healthy happy woman or a healthy happy man uh, caused him such narcissistic injury um, because he was incredibly jealous incredibly insecure whatever it is that he really didn't want you to do well and even if he said you know i want you to do well i want you to do me proud you you knew you 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 understood with your intuition on some level that he would be happier if you didn't if that it's called an interject if that internalized authority figure and their intention is not deliberately and consciously and patiently deconstructed over time, it will continue to manifest in your life. You'll always have that. So if you say, um, I, I just can't make good decisions when it comes to setting up my business. I can do anything, but when it comes to setting up my business, I'm just riddled with emotional flashbacks. Or every relationship I get into, I keep on getting into relationships with abusive people. I read the books, I went to the seminar, I, I did uh, six months of therapy and here I am, I'm still doing it again you haven't dealt with this internalized person, the internalized voice, and the internalized intention that they had for you. If they want you, uh, I'm saying now, not necessarily the external person, but now the internal person, if that simulated being that you're now carrying inside of your head wants you to self-destruct, you will. 
if that internalized being wants you to remain in abusive relationships, indeed, in a certain sense, if they want you to carry on the abuse that they started, they'll make sure that that happens. And we have to deal with this head on. So there's the internalized voice thing. So um, there's something else. Have you, there's a, there's a, what is it called? I always get these back to front. Asclepius, Caduceus. There's two snakes on a pole and they represent commerce, but sometimes they're accidentally put on like the side of ambulances, which they shouldn't be, because the one that should go on the side of ambulances that's related to medicine um, is one snake. And I think it has a winged um, staff. Let me check. Staff. Caduceus. Yeah, the Caduceus, the Caduceus, Caduceus is the staff carried by Hermes in Greek mythology and consequently by Hermes Trismegistus in Greco-Egyptian mythology. Very important magical symbol. And this is the one with the wings on it. This one. Okay, so there's two snakes. Look at this. Look at this. Internalize this. It's actually supposed to represent commerce. It's not supposed to represent medicine. The medicine one is uh, one snake. And it's the staff of, it's the rod of Asclepius. There's two snakes inside of you. When you are recovering from narcissistic abuse, there are two battling snakes around this staff, as it were, which is your, let's say the staff represents your sovereignty. Let's say the staff represents your capacity to base yourself and to reach up into higher realms from the floor. The staff, you know, between heaven and earth, there's this phallic uh, uh, Freudian staff sticking upright proudly and what's controlling the direction of the staff are these two snakes what am i talking about is this a suddenly become a youtube video about magical symbology no i want you to have a symbol inside of your head to understand why narcissistic abuse is so painful so let's put that uh, to one side for one second the staff with two snakes put it to one side you have internalized voices. They're from authority figures and they carry a message. They have words and they have an intention. When you are recovering from narcissistic abuse and you're exhausted all the time, you're always in emotional flashbacks. You're, you're obsessed with the idea of narcissism. You want the next redefined, redefined, redefined definition of what narcissism plus minus BPD with a dash of HPD and a side order of uh, a psychopathy looks like and how it manifests and you're reading these books and you're watching these youtube videos that's actually a manifestation of the of the sickness of being bitten of being poisoned and the poison when it bites you it sets off an internal battle so there are now two internal voices that are battling for your sovereignty for your capacity to connect between earth and heaven which if you like it would just be a metaphor for say your purpose or your philosophy, or your morality, or your uh, your spirituality, your connection with, with God, your connection with um, Christ consciousness, with Buddhahood, or, or whatever you believe. Who are these two snakes? Who are these two poisonous snakes that are battling inside of you? These are, to use the psychoanalytic theory language, battling superego injunctions. The narcissist has effectively split you down the middle and poisoned you. There are two poisonous snakes at war inside of you. And there, it's a fight. And I say this um, uh, advisedly, carefully, and I can back it up. It's not vaguely a fight between good and evil. It's actually, verifiably, a fight between good and evil. As in your individual sense of right and wrong. So these two snakes have poisoned you, they're fighting, and they're battling for control of your sovereignty. And it is a battle for good versus evil. So when we take on authority figure voices as children in our lives, they're guiding us based on a map. And their map is either moving you towards good 
or it's moving you towards evil. So let's say for the sake of argument, because I don't want this to be an ultra long uh, YouTube video, it's not. I have a philosophy channel, it's called Richard Grant and Philosophy, if we wanted to try and like unpack that. Let's just keep it really simple. Here, good is healthy and life affirming. Here, bad is um, unhealthy and life denying. Simple. That's a nice little, we just use that as like a, a, a yardstick, seeing as there's so many sticks in our minds now already. Oh. And what's this battle between, what do you mean it's a battle between good and evil? It's a battle between good and evil. It's an internal jihad between your sense, you, not the world sense, not the world sense. Now, this is tough. This is, we'll do this a little bit philosophically. It's not what is out there that counts at this moment in this battle. And this is very tough. And so you can create a pretty strong case that when you are bitten and poisoned in narcissistic abuse, you're in a spiritual battle. You might not have a spirituality. You might not be a, a religious person at all. You might be a diehard atheist. Don't care. It's happening. Why? Because of something called moral injury. You've experienced a moral injury. And now you need a moral resolution, not a psychological one. The psychology will help. It will for sure support you. But you'll never put this battle down. And the snakes will continue fighting and hurting you because you all know what it's like when there's two parts of you. So one part of you is saying, um, this person's really bad. And remember what he did, remember what she did, remember how they did this and this and this, and they hurt me. And the other part of you is saying, no, no, they're, it's okay. They're not that bad. They're, they're wounded. They have childhood trauma. You just need to love them more. And then the other side of you go, no, I can't help them like that. It's not, who cares about their childhood trauma? You could uh, excuse any crime in history if you started using childhood trauma to, to apply it to everything and on and on and on. And the fight is exhausting. The fight is called cognitive dissonance. I see gaslighting online has come to mean lying, which is incorrect. Everybody here knows what the correct meaning of gaslighting is. Cognitive dissonance is one of those things that sounds like something else and is also misused quite frequently in online psychology spaces. I'm going to give you a, a slightly different definition, but it will it will anchor. It's, to, it's a mnemonic. It's to help you remember. It's to anchor how to understand cognitive dissonance. You should understand cognitive dissonance as a, it says cognitive. So you think, oh, it's brain, like my brain uh, doesn't understand. And then you might start thinking it's like a Freudian fetishist split. It's not. That's not That's not what this is. It's related, but it's not what this is. Cognitive dissonance is a somatic body-based experience. It's called cognitive dissonance, but it's actually, I don't know, maybe we should call it somatic dissonance. It's felt in the body as stress because you're trying to hold two completely contradictory pieces of information in the same space as they rear up like snakes and fight each other. And it's enormously stressful. Now, when we say information in psychology, that could include your behaviors. That could include the other person's behaviors. It's, it's uh, all not information as in like information technology, all data in the environment and it's fighting. So you're experiencing this tremendous cognitive dissonance, which is enormously stressful and goes on for far too long. And guess what happens? You start to get physically sick and then the immune system disorders start showing up. You don't sleep. You either gain a lot of weight or you lose a lot of weight. Um, you start developing allergies that you've never had before. All of this was true for me. Uh, and, and a whole host of immune system related disorders crop up because your system is constantly on high alert trying to win this battle and you can't move on until this battle is resolved. How is it resolved? You have to resolve it morally. You have to resolve it philosophically. You may have walked into this relationship being like, I don't really care about philosophy. I don't really care about spirituality bleh, I just thought they were hot and like bleh, yeah it's cool doesn't matter because now you're in it now you're in it so there's only way there's only one way out 
you're going to have to develop a moral philosophy. I've been saying this for years, and it, it, I just watch people's eyes just glaze over when I say it. They're like, oh, that sounds really boring. It's actually really, really easy. It's really quick. Um, and the more you practice it, the easier it gets. You're going to have to, to decide on your own, not through the world. No church can give you this. No imam is going to give you this. No book will give you this. You decide, and then you live it. If you don't decide and you don't live it, you're never going to recover. You're never going to recover. You decide what is good. You decide what is bad. You decide what is acceptable inside of a relationship. You decide what is unacceptable inside of a relationship, whether it is career, whether it is friends, whether it is romance, whether it is family, and then you stick to those boundaries. That's the only way the cognitive dissonance is going to be resolved as if you can resolve the issue of the moral injury. Is what they did wrong or not? If you can say, finally, with a calm heart, not out of rage, not out of anger, not out of your own ego and narcissistic injury, it is wrong to do that to people. It's very simple, this is wrong. And then you can live in accordance with that decision and accept that it was wrong. It's a lack of acceptance that keeps people trapped in narcissistically abusive relationships. Ironically enough, some of the least egoic people in the world will be trapped inside of narcissistically abusive relationships because of ego, because we stay stiff, we stay stubborn, we stay egoic. No, no, no. And instead of saying no, you should be looking for a simple, calm-hearted, this is right, this is wrong. I don't allow that which I know to be wrong in my life. And that is all there is to it. If you can achieve that, you can start to get these negative superego injunctions out of your head. And this cognitive dissonance battle that is so stressful and so painful and so confusing between the two snakes that have bitten you, that are raging in a battle inside of you and fighting for control of your sovereignty and fighting for control um, of your connection to, to spirit, to philosophy, to morality, to God, Buddha, whatever you happen to believe. The best of humanity, we could say the real best of what human beings are capable of, to ascend, to go upward, not downward. When you can resolve that question and you can live that resolution, you can begin to put it to bed. And then the narcissist will not be able to live in your head anymore. Because when their foolish injunctions, their foolish words and intentions show up in a morally ambiguous, bivalent vacuum which most of us live in don't be embarrassed like everybody like what what's which part when was the last time you watched a tv show that was like hey everybody let's just sit around and philosophize for an hour and a half about what's right and wrong i mean those tv shows exist um but they're usually on religious channels and very few people watch them because they're usually watching multi-millionaires with a uh, plastic surgery butt cheeks instead because that's what humans actually really like is multi-millionaires with huge, huge ass cheeks. And this is why the aliens won't help. They're just like, this civilization is in stage five. And until it hits the stage four, we ain't doing shit. We're just gonna let them keep going. What is this obsession with butt cheeks? And they're like, well, I don't know. They just really like rich people with huge asses. What am I talking about? So once that's resolved, um, you can then start to look at the breakdown of the shared fantasy space. The shared fantasy space is the one that you entered when you began the narcissistic, the abusive relationship. You will not be able to escape this until you've dealt with red pill, blue pill, good, bad questions of morality and action and consequence because actions have consequences. <gasps> actions have consequences. That's called karma. It's just action and effect. You've entered inside of a matrix pod and been force fed a simulated version of reality that's like um, high octane. And you're now addicted 
to the narcissistic supply of that. Don't worry, it doesn't mean you are a narcissist. It's just that you've gotten addicted to the the um, fluviance of uh, the narcissistic pod. You're in that pink goo and it's flavoured with like, um, sprinkled with like cocaine and MDMA. And now you're, you're acclimatised to that. You take that out and you come back to normal life you're going to be jonesing for it again. You're going to be thinking, oh, where do I get some more of that? Hey, man, you got any of that narcissistic abuse, man? <laughs> like scratching yourself, like, hey, man, <laughs> you got any of that narcissistic abuse for me? So you've got to realize that's what's happening. You've got to see a therapist. You've got to work with a therapist. And then you have to deconstruct that matrix because that fantasy space had good stuff inside of it. You also need to rescue it. Like what was good? You were promised something that was a simulation. It wasn't real. But maybe the things that were in that simulation could be real if you were smart and you worked for them and you went to therapy and you integrated your shadow and you did your meditations and you became more aware and you learned to watch yourself and you learned to watch your impulses. Maybe the good stuff from that shared fantasy matrix simulation could be real, could become real for you if you worked at it. So to eradicate the narcissistic voice and the narcissistic intention inside of your head, you have those two jobs to do. You have to find a way of resolving the fight between the two poisonous snakes that are currently battling inside of you in the way that I told you to do at minute 21. And then you have to go about the business with a therapist of deconstructing what you two built together because there's you there's the other person, and then there's the relationship, which is a third entity. No different in a narcissistically abusive relationship. This idea of shared fantasy is completely healthy and completely normal. There's you, if it's a healthy relationship, there's you, your partner, and the third thing, which is the shared, this the fantasy role play, the game that the two of you engage in, and that's fine. It's not fine when it's narcissistically abusive. That's not fine. It will not disappear of its own accord. We have to go after it and attack it directly. That's 27 minutes. I'm ready to take questions. You may ask me whatever questions you want. Whilst you're writing your questions, make them one sentence long and have them end in a question mark. Can I just give you a little piece of advice? Nobody comes here for health advice. I had, I was diagnosed with sleep apnea and metabolic syndrome over the summer. And um, that my prognosis was uh, eight to 12 years of life. I'm 45, eight to 12 years of life before I would die of either a heart attack or a stroke. Such was the severity of the sleep apnea. And um, I uh, worked with a friend of mine, Stella, um, from September the 19th to now, which is December the, December the 6th. In that time, I lost 7.5 kilos. I was 101 kilos. My snoring has been reduced down to zero. And I'm going to play you a sound of what I sounded like when I had severe sleep apnea, which is humiliating and embarrassing for me. But I'm doing it so that you will take this seriously. Everybody can download an app for free. I don't get commission for this. It's called Snore Lab. You put it next to you when you sleep. It's free. It records you sleeping and it gives you a snore score. If you have sleep apnea and they think that 80% of people who have it go undiagnosed, you are reducing your quality of life, your sex drive, your cognition massively, and you will die younger of either a heart attack or a stroke, 100%. This is science because you're inducing massive amounts of stress on your body when you sleep, when you stop breathing. Okay, the worst score I ever got was an 89 out of 100. Listen to this. That is not a sound of a healthy man asleep. There's a, so there's really, really bad ones here where, I, where you can hear me fighting for breath. So I'll go. And then I'll start breathing again. I was doing that um, on the sleep score I had. Uh, they said 50 t 55 times an hour. It's a very, very severe case of sleep apnea, which is why they gave me the prognosis that they gave me. I won't be dead inside of eight to 12 years. I shall be fine. 
soon I will get retested for sleep apnea. And I hope I'm not using a CPAP machine anymore. Um, I hope that I'll be able to, because I'm getting like the snore score I got last night is five. I have nothing. Get tested, download this app, test yourself. And if you have a snore score of over 60, find a sleep clinic, ask them to send you a sleep apnea kit, kit and find out whether you have sleep apnea or not. Do it for your partner, for your children, for your parents, for yourself. Do it. There's no reason to die just because we're carrying too much mass, which is largely what the problem is. The neck and the shot, like bodybuilders get it. I found this out. I spoke to my friends who are bodybuilders and I was like, hey guys, you need to realize something. If you're taking steroids, because steroids inflames it for reasons that they're not 100% sure of, it's not just about mass. They think it might create internal inflammation. If you're really big, if you're a power lifter or you're really big, you get sleep apnea. And they're like, yeah, we know, we all have it. I was like, you'll, you'll die. Like, yeah, we know, but we'll die big and beautiful. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> That's absolutely insane. But there you go. Um, I've been working with uh, my friend Stella. She put me on a course where you manage your uh, diet, your exercise, your sleep, your stress management, and your life organization. And uh, she's had me on it for 10 weeks. And in that time, I've resolved most of these issues. It's also, you remember me complaining about insomnia for years? Usually I couldn't sleep for more than four or five hours at a time. And I'd wake up for like an hour agitated and I'd sleep again. That stopped. First time in my adult life, it stopped. I can sleep an enjoyable sleep. Use at the moment now for around seven hours a night, nonstop. It is wonderful. It is heavenly. I highly recommend it. It's nice to be higher energy. It's nice to have clearer thinking. It's nice to have lower stress and enjoy your life more as well. If you want to join me on the uh, Structured with Style course, we've got a new intake that starts tomorrow. I'll put the link in the more information bar below. Now, let me take your questions. Oh, Richard, I know the sleep stuff is serious, but you do kill me with laughter. Thanks for your humor. It is serious, but nobody will listen to me if I don't make them laugh at the same time. Miss Rabbit, how to grief, how to how to grief a long term narcissistic relationship after leaving? Um, well, grieving is a skill. You should see a therapist who specializes in narcissistic abuse and a therapist who hopefully specializes in grieving. Let's do this now to find a therapist, ladies and gentlemen. You can go online. The internet is a wonderful resource for finding therapists. You don't need to see a therapist face to face. Zoom or Skype or Telegram or WhatsApp video is fine. You can go to a counseling directory in your country or state, or you can go to a psychology directory in your country or state. When you find the counseling directory or the psychology directory, you can look for the psychological modality you want to work with. I don't do that. You can have any modality you want. I need to get on with the human being. I don't really care what system they're trained in but you can look up what their specialities are. You want somebody who can talk the lingo of CPTSD, narcissistic abuse, and it would be good if they had more than a passing understanding of the effects of childhood trauma. I've used an internal family systems guy. He was great. I used a CBT guy. He was great. I'm currently with a guy who does transactional analysis. He's great. Doesn't, doesn't matter what, to me, it doesn't matter what the modality is. So you look them up based on what you want. Take 10 off that counseling directory. Cost you nothing but time. 10 of the people you like the look of. Ask, uh, uh, then whittle it down to five that you really, really like the look of. Ask all five of them for a 10-minute interview. They'll give it to you for free. If they have the time in their schedule, if they're booked, they're not going to be able to, but you wouldn't get a booking with them anyway. If they have time in their schedule, they'll easily happily most counselors and therapists will give you a 10 to 15 minute interview you just say to them like i just want to see if i get on with you and like, can we chat for like 10 minutes just maybe over the phone or on skype and then work with the person you felt the best connection with do find a therapist do go to therapy it will help you and um, so grieving is something that you're best off doing with a therapist the long-term narcissistic relationship i recommend that you follow the advice that I gave earlier in this video that will be re-uploaded after I finish, um, and that you do work uh, to deconstruct the narcissistic uh, uh, matrix simulation fantasy that's been created between the two of you. I have a course that teaches you how to do that. It's called Unplug from the Matrix of Narcissistic Abuse. It is not an easy course, and in fact, it's probably best done with a therapist. 
There is an easier leading course called Break Narcissistic Possession, which anybody can do at home. Most of the, the thick end of the wedge of the um, work of the course, you just listen. You listen and you follow along to the audio exercises. So that's a good way to get started with that as well. Is forgiveness the first step to freedom? Uh, humility, humility, um, confession, you know, saying like, I maybe made a mistake here. I maybe was trying to do something that I couldn't do. Um, and then forgiving yourself for sure. But you die big and beautiful. Bodybuilders are built different. They're a strange breed. I love them. I'm some good friends who are bodybuilders, but their attitude, that's, that is a wild sport. There's no sport like that is gets so deep. I, I would love to do a documentary on the psychology of bodybuilding because there's no sport like that. There's no sport that's so invasive in every single part of your life. Um, you know, your sex life, your diet, your, your sleep patterns, everything, everything, everything has to be on point. I used to laugh at these guys. Don't tell them because they'll hurt me um, because they're bigger than me. But when I was doing martial arts, I'd be like, posing in your little pink pants. <laughs> What's that all about? Real men just punch each other in the skull. Yeah, that didn't work out too well for me. So I'm sat here with, <laughs> what's it called? I can't remember what it's called. A TBI, traumatic brain injury, multiple skull fractures and a split bag around my brain. At massive uh, stroke risk. I wish I'd done, I wish I'd done bodybuilding now, but it's it's such a it's such a hard sport. It's such a tough sport that they're, that they're engaged in. Uh, hi, darling. Ew, no, please. Don't speak to me that way. My dad is coming over this weekend. Hope that I can spend time with them. Just singular father and <laughs> but them. It's your dad are they. <laughs> He's a dad they. He's a they dad. He's a zer. He's a z. I don't, I don't know. He can be whatever he wants. Hi, Marty. I'm so sorry. I didn't understand your question. Uh, please feel free to ask it again. Your dad's not a Z or it's a or a Zaddy. Zaddy chill. Is it okay to say that the injunctions of the NPD parent are creating another personality inside the child? Wait. Let me just stop laughing at my own jokes. I am a mature, responsible adult. Is it okay to say that the injunctions of the MPD parent are creating another personality inside the child? No, <laughs> please don't. No, no, no. It's, it's totally normal to have injunctions running inside of your head. Um, whether they cause uh, or are a contributing factor to dissociative identity disorder, whether dissociative identity disorder even exists as such, would be would be a topic of discussion for another day. But no, no. Um, I, it wouldn't be quite like that. Uh, the closest I would go with you on that one is um, if you look at something like parts therapy or internal family systems, we could say these are, these are parts. This would th this could become a part, not a not a personality, but a part. So then there would be unintegrated parts of the person that are in conflict with each other, they're operating against each other. So that's more like an IFS parts therapy model. Uh, but it's an it's a it's a good question like you're asking the right question um i just didn't i just the personality would need to be like a full a full thing it's not it's not a full thing um but uh it's definitely a part let me catch up um comment okay yasmin says forgiving doesn't remove negativity from you how is not forgiving the abuser negative shake my head you can accept what happened and move on doesn't mean you have to forgive the abuser i didn't say you have to forgive the abuser or oh, i said you have to forgive yourself my back Oof. um just found your channel says liberty in trust who sent me five dollars that's very kind of you uh, you're preaching truth carry on and continue you're aiding helping everyone thank you that's very kind of you liberty trust i appreciate that thank you um i'm just happy to see your videos richard you're a real one appreciate you gracias anonymous 
Gracias. Which course would you recommend to start for abuse recovery? Um, you know, if you watch the videos here and you take notes and you're like, what can I, maybe if you did that for like, for the free version would be to do three or four hours and sort of journal it and interact with the material and be like, okay, what do I need to do? What is he telling me to do? That would be the free version. And you should be journaling. You should be taking notes anyway. Um, you should consider getting a therapist in the way that I advised about five minutes ago uh, through counseling directories, preferably one who specializes in narcissistic abuse. And then the entry level course is, is break narcissistic possession. That will get you um, to a place where you feel more emotionally regulated, where you're ready to move forward with a life. I mean, a lot of that course is focused on, on helping people to build lives that are peaceful where you have a peaceful life, where things are in order, they have a structure. I mean, another piece of advice that I would give people if you're in recovery, I, you know, I think I had Russell Brand say this once, or maybe he was talking generally about his life. He was saying he needs a lot of order as a recovering drug addict. He has an ordered life. He lives in accordance with the timetable. He doesn't eat what he wants whenever he wants to. You know, he has like yoga scheduled and BJJ scheduled and meditation scheduled. That's actually good advice. Like, don't just wake up and go about your day if you're recovering from narcissistic abuse. Find a timetable and, and live in accordance with the timetable and really seek to be physically healthy and get your sleep sorted. My God, I cannot emphasize this enough. I am living in a different reality. Like, when it comes to recovery from trauma, and there are physical um, reasons for this i can get my friend danny wilson on who knows a lot more about sleep and the impacts of sleep than i do uh, to talk about that to recover from trauma you must sleep it's it's physical it's it's in order for your brain to adapt and and have the neuroplasticity to absorb what has happened without getting stuck on it you must sleep i can't recommend guys enough get get on the uh Structure with Stellar Course, it's eight weeks. I mean, you can continue if you want to beyond the eight weeks, but jump on it for eight weeks, regulate your sleep, regulate your food, regulate your exercise, check in with other people doing the same thing and just get it sorted. It really, it really helps. It really, really massively helps on every level. Like your mental health will improve dramatically. It's not just about like that old meme of saying, oh, go for a walk, you'll feel better, no. If your hormonal profile is better because your lifestyle is better, your body and your brain and your emotions are more capable of dealing with uh, the, the the trauma of what you've been through. It is traumatic. Are you going to do lives more often? Oh, I hope so. I quite like doing lives. Resting before therapy. Um. Pat Riot says, my sleep schedule is a disaster. Mine was too, I was a terrible, terrible um, insomnia, but that was partly because of sleep apnea and partly because I just wasn't living in accordance to a uh, schedule, which is why somebody like Stella, I mean, Stella's good. She's a qualified coach. She's a good strength coach, but she's really, she's really good with this lifestyle stuff and regulating your lifestyle. And she's really strict. Like she's super disciplined with herself. So she'll check in with me every day. She's like, how's your sleep? Like I slept for seven point five hours last night. Is that okay? Dobro. Mm. And then she she lets me go about my day. <laughs> you, you everybody needs a, a strict Croatian trainer in their life. Everybody needs that. You don't know you need it until you have one, and then you'll be like, no, no, this is better. Uh, what is the name of the app, sir? It's Snorlab. Let me, uh, there, so, Snore Lab. Snore Lab, it's free. Start using it. Try it for 10 days and see what kind of a pattern you get. Even, you know, it tells you how long you've been asleep for, which is which is good data. Like, you might be like, oh, I'm really tired and I don't know why. Oh, I slept for six hours and I snored for 60% of that time. Well, that's why you're still tired. You are awesome. Genuinely have helped me in so many ways. I hope you're happy. I am. Thank you.
Does the modeling business foster narcissism in young people? Wow. I have done too many years of NLP because I was, I read that as modeling as like a verb, like are you modeling a business? The modeling business foster narcissism in young people. How dangerous is this? Well, it's certainly going to emphasize the most superficial elements of a person. It's funny, you know, like I'm Gen X, I'm 45 years old. Zoolander, when I was growing up, was a funny movie with Ben. Somebody in the comments, quickly tell me. I've been hitting the head too many times. Ben Stiller. Um, that was funny. Uh, I was a joke, but we came to live that broad scale. Like he predicted the way people would use Instagram. Unironically, there's more. There's nothing more to life than being really, really good looking and just posing and looking at themselves. There's going to be a whole new slew of mental health diagnoses related to technology and social media usage. I don't think it's as easy as just saying like people who are looking at themselves too much are just going to develop narcissistic personality disorder. I think they're going to develop other issues. I think they'll develop body dysmorphia. There was even a case I need to look it up because I've cited this a few times on here without without reading uh, the case uh, notes properly. But I'm pretty sure there's a British guy. I think he was young. And uh, maybe I'll butcher this story. I think he was taking like a thousand selfies an hour. And they had to get him off his phone and not let him take a selfie of himself by slow exposure to no phone time. And it was like, they would put him in a room and be like, okay, you're gonna do five minutes without your phone in your hand and no selfies, then seven and then eight and then nine. And I believe that he found this really, really difficult. So, and you can see that, like these kids, they're addicted to dopamine. I see my cousins and how they use the phone and, you're talking to them and then you turn your back and they're like in the phone, like, like you'll be like, yeah, yeah. And then we'll, yeah, we'll go to the restaurant afterwards. Yeah. That'd be cool. Can you give a lift? Yeah. Sound. And then you turn your back and they're like this in the phone. you will be like, are you having a fit? What are you doing? I'm on Snapchat, isn't it? I'm Snapchat my friends, isn't it? Uh, 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 uh. That's not healthy. Like I can't see how, that kind of like broken up, just the breakup in your consciousness flow is not great, but then the overemphasis on looks and materialism is not good. It is the tool of shaitan. Do you think a gut feeling is a real intelligence? Could be. And if so, how can you translate a weird feeling in your gut is trying to tell you? Um, it's a certain kind of emotional intelligence that you need. And if, uh, you're not feeling very emotionally literate, it will be difficult. So some people who are traumatized, they're not in touch with their emotions. They're a bit frozen. And that emotional intelligence is what you need to understand intuition. So you need to be talking, talking, you need to be in regular communication with your emotions, with your body, with your somatic space, with your emotional space, be like, what am I feeling? What is this trying to tell me? Because it could be like you say, you call it intuition. Maybe I would say like messages from the unconscious and you want them. You want those things. That's good. Ooh. When does the smear campaign end? Uh, probably if they move on, like if they, if they, if, if besmirching your name is no longer a priority, if they move on to a new source of supply, if they run out of energy, if they realize it's not having the, the effect that they wanted. I feel like I totally left the shared fancy space, but every time he smears me, I'm being reminded of that crap. You can say crap on here. It's okay. I don't mind. Oh, my back. Speaking of sleeping, it's probably something I should do soon. Mm. Okay, any more questions, folks? And then we'll, we'll wrap it. What would you say the issue of narcissism is more prominent in developed countries than third world ones due to the lack of widely available tech materialism and way of living circus and bread panem et circum shadows and dust maximus shadows and dust we have uh, a problem um probably best described as as affluenza we're too wealthy and we're not 
let me blag evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology for a moment. I'm going to speak to an evolutionary psychologist in a few weeks. I'll check this with him. Professor Ed Dutton is interviewing me on the 15th in London. Um, but I heard Brett Weinstein say it, and it's probably correct. Like, we are not a good evolutionary match for the environment that we have created. We're not evolved for this amount of abundance and our wealth and our comfort and our ease of living is driving us bonkers, which is ironic and kind of sick, but also makes sense. Like we're not, if you think of evolutionary as a kind of biological conditioning, if you think of evolutionary, did I say that? I'm, I'm getting tired now. If you think of evolution as a kind of biological conditioning, what are we conditioned for? Stress, trauma, famine, brrr, all kinds of, you know, horror probably most of us died of starvation and vile illnesses you know if you most of us as in the thick end of the wedge of, of of homo sapiens how did they go out probably starved or died of disease and in fact well no no we know how they went out like most humans didn't most humans up until recently just die before they were eight years old or a very very high number the child mortality rate used to be massively higher than it is now so we're not adapted to this we're not used to this so like, yes, narcissism is, is a part of that. Um, codependency, I would claim is a part of that. Some of these things are an, a, a, an adaptive response. If you look at the human enterprise, it's almost like a virus. The mutation towards demanding attention because there's less attention available because there's more and more humans in the human. So, it's it's technology, it's wealth, it's material pleasure, it's a lack of horror and drama that we're used to. And then it's the sheer numbers of us. There's a problem with the fact that we have so many of us that we have, because we're not we're absolutely not adapted to this. What is it? Our population exploded from 1 billion to 8 billion between the writing of the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx in 1850 to today that that's way too it's not even 200 years and we've exploded in numbers i personally i can't say that's not like that's just my personal opinion i don't think where we can handle that there are so many people in this and, and attention is becoming such a precious resource we're living in and this is like the numbers of us the number of the population our technology our social media usage you just can't get attention you just can't get attention, but you need it. Like we need, we need that. We need human interaction. So I'm one of those weird half hippie guys, but also half a survivor guy who's like stock up on guns and learn Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, man. Um, but also like take ayahuasca and just blend into the unconscious of the universe. Who would be saying that, uh, that the both of those guys that live in me, would be saying uh, a lot of our problems would be resolved um, in a zombie apocalypse. What the fuck? A lot of our problems would be resolved if we lived, you know, like the Walking Dead series when it was good. For all of the horror and badness that was happening, people who had had ADHD their whole lives, people who'd had uh, certain types of anxiety their whole lives, people who'd had that depression their whole lives, a lot of those psychological issues would be resolved in that environment within six or seven days because because of epigenetics you, and it it would be awful but it would and it would present whole new horrors but there would be an amelioration of other symptoms i claim and a lot of our problems would be resolved by uh, being forced into situations of low resource and low choice where we were interdependent even with people that we politically didn't agree with or they love Taylor Swift and we fucking hate Taylor Swift. But then you're like, oh, if I don't look after them, they're actually quite good at sewing up wounds. And if I have wounds, like I'll die. So I better protect them from being killed, which is how we actually, that's what we're evolved for. Um, and then we're all first forced to just sit around a campfire at night and just look at each other's dumb faces because no phones, no TV. We would be happier. We would be more at peace. Um, but only a conscious choice to leave 
civilization and go and live in a commune um, or an actual apocalypse would create those conditions. But much of, of, of our suffering with this, if we're forced to just like be in nature more and just be stimulated less and, and we were forced to not talk as much. Just I would just say to people, like, if, I, if I was running a cult, sorry, when I run a cult, when, if I run a cult, <laughs> when I run a cult, part of the cult would be like uh, uh, vows of silence where it would go on for days because I would just say like, language is an infection. Humans infect each other with insanity. Stop talking to each other. If you want to talk to something, you can look at each other. You can help each other. You can cook for each other. You can, you can touch each other. That's fine. Don't fucking talk. Shut up. Talk to the stars when the stars are out. By day, listen to the birds and talk to the trees. Do that for a month, you wouldn't. You would come out completely changed. You're n you're not touching a phone. You won't hear a car engine. You will hear. You will. You will hear or see nothing from the modern world for one month. Nothing. And you'll eat good food, and uh, you'll be allowed to sleep as much as you want because everybody will turn up completely frazzled from the evil civilization that we've created. And you'll be able to talk sometimes, maybe at night. You'll just be allowed to talk around the campfire when people have so much to say and so many stories to tell because they've had to shut the fuck up all day. <laughs> but I would say don't talk so much because you're infecting each other. We're all crazy. All of humanity is insane. And we're infecting each other with our crazy ideas and our words. Shh. That's the sound of sanity. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. I look forward to speaking to you again very, very soon. If you want to join us, Strong with Stella, you can start that. Well, we'll start in tomorrow, a second intake, but we'll take people on for the next four or five days. But jump on it and get into good shape over Christmas and then come out January the 1st. Like, look at me. I'm in amazing shape and sleeping well and feeling good and high energy and all of that good stuff. Thank you very much. I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Cheers.